Welcome back to Conflicts of Interest. This is episode 551. I'm the host of the show, Kyle Lanslone. Today, joined by co host Connor Freeman. Connor, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Kyle. How are you? I'm all right, Connor. We, we really don't have much good news to talk about on today's show, which is disappointing, but a lot to talk about today. The war state is ramping up to pass the massive war funding bill, the $95 billion monstrosity. And uh, that's just going to give Israel more weapons. And right, and right now they're using them to carry out just awful, horrific crimes against civilians. Uh, so all that and more on today's show. Be sure to share the show. It's hosted at the Libertarian Institute. You can follow the show on Twitter at con underscore interest. My Twitter handle is at Kyle Loan underscore. And Connor, uh, what's your handle again? Uh, at Freeman's Mind 96. That's right. I always want to say some part of that wrong. Uh, but anyways, <laughs> we're hosted and all of our work is published at the Libertarian Institute. We repost the show on the blog at antiwar.com, YouTube, Rumble, and Odyssey for the video version of the show. And it's anywhere you could listen to audio podcasts. Got some Ukraine news to start on today's show. There's a lot of important stuff happening uh, with, with what, what's going on in this war. And the most important thing here really is Democrats signaled they would protect Speaker Johnson if he brought Ukraine aid to floor vote. So this is uh, from Dave DeCamp at Antiwar.com. Representative Hakeem Jeffries, the top Democrat in the House, has suggested that Democrats would protect Speaker Mike Johnson from being ousted if he brought the $95 billion foreign military aid bill to a floor vote. Some Republicans have threatened to oust Johnson as Speaker if he holds a vote on the bill, and it would only take about one GOP member to file the motion to vacate the Speakership, which would bring about the vote to oust him. And the gap in Congress is very small, Connor, and so if he needs to get a majority, then, you know, there's only, I think, within five or eight Republicans now that would just have to not vote for him. And without the Democrat support, then, you know, he would be ousted as speaker. And this is what happened to representative Kevin McCarthy a couple months ago. Now it seems to me, Connor, that, you know, they don't need the whole democratic caucus to agree to this, but rather, you know, just the leadership and guarantee of 50 to hundred members go along with the scheme uh, seems like it would be more than enough to to fulfill this plan. So uh, Jeffrey said, it does seem to me based on informal conversations that were Speaker Johnson to do the right thing, relieve uh, relative to the meeting, the significant national security needs of the American people by putting it on the floor for an up and down vote, there will be a reasonable number of people in the House Democratic Caucus who will take the position that he should not fall as a result. So, Connor, there's a couple things in there. I think the biggest joke, of course, is calling this national security in any way about the American people. Uh, you know, it's hard pressed to actually say this is about the uh, Ukrainian people, uh, you know, who they really tout as being the beneficiaries of this. Of course, it's just going to keep them fighting a little bit longer. So, you know, this is for the benefit of the neocons who think that the ultimate goal in the world has to be to break the Russian state really, you know, what they're trying to do. And so they think, you know, grinding down the, the Russian state more on Ukraine is successful. Of course, that's awful to throw the Ukrainians into that meat grinder just to keep it churning. But that's what uh, the neocons want and are willing to do. And of course, as they so gleefully point out to us all the time now, Connor, in an effort to get us to support this war, is that most of the money is going to be spent first in the United States. So they're going to, you know, buy whatever kind of missiles, stinger missiles, artillery shells, all these kinds of weapons from American made weapons makers. And they say, this is good jobs in 40 states. And aren't you excited, Connor? This is going to revitalize the American economy when, you know, uh, William Hartung has done some really good work on these aren't really good jo jobs or anything like that. Typically, they're, you know, hard jobs, uh, you know, very labor intensive, but they don't pay particularly well. I think there is a plant in Phoenix where the average salary was like under $40,000 a year. Now, this was two years ago. So the, um, you know, inflation of the past couple of years might have bumped that up somewhat significantly. But still, you know, we're not talking about like upper middle class jobs in a lot of these places. We're talking about, you know, maybe a job that will keep you in the middle class while breaking your back. And of course, it's, you know, the Nikki Haley's of the world, 
the Victorian Newlands of the world who really benefit from this policy, either when they're sitting on the boards of these companies, Raytheon, Boeing, General Dynamics, Lockheed Martin, or when those companies either donate to their congressional campaigns or donate to their pads or donate to their presidential runs or donate to their think tanks or whatever they want to call them, where they formulate the plans that say the American people need to give all this aid uh, to Ukraine and Israel. And of course, you know, Connor, uh, you, you have to wonder if at any point the war in Israel becomes so horrific that Maybe that has to get stripped out of this bill, but it, it doesn't seem to be going forward. Now, we'll talk about some of the horrors that are going on in Gaza and Nets. But first, a couple of stories here on Ukraine. European official says everyone knows there are Western Special Operations Forces in Ukraine. So this is Dave DeCamp, Antiwar.com. In the wake of French President Marcon's statement about Western countries not ruling out sending troops to Ukraine, a European official speaking to the Financial Times pointed out that Western Special Operations Forces are already in the country. Everyone knows there are Western Special Forces in Ukraine. They've just not acknowledged it officially, a senior European defense official said. The discourse leads revealed that last year, as of March 2023, there were 97 NATO Special Operator soldiers in Ukraine, including 14 American and 50 British troops. The leak confirmed earlier reporting from The Intercept that said the U.S. Special Operations Forces were on the ground, along with CIA operatives. It's unclear if the number of NATO troops inside Ukraine has changed since the Discord leaks or, you know, potentially their role in their country or, or anything like that. But, of course, Connor, that is not a revelation you know, just that they're special operators of, of Western countries in Ukraine to our audience. So, uh, you know, the, the current situation is unclear, but, you know, he is confirming that it's still going on. French officials have insisted that Marcon was not talking about taking about sending a large number of troops to fight in Ukraine, suggesting he was talking about training missions. Many NATO members distanced themselves from the remarks and said they weren't planning to send troops. But Marcon received support from Lithuania, which said is discussing sending troops for training. And this is a major part of the Ukrainian problem, Connor. It's not just that, you, you know, we talk about the manpower shortage. And a lot of people think that that means, you know, they just need to find some young fools to go and stick on the front lines and hold back the Russians. And it, it's really not that simple, you know, to have any kind of meaningful uh, presence, right? You remember the, the mock meat grinder where they're talking about young men dying every uh, four hours. These are barely trained young men. So just throwing more men at the problem isn't what Ukraine writes. They need trained soldiers who can actually fight and hold off the Russians. And so they need trainers. Uh, the problem is, is that they can't ship large number of Ukrainians outside of the country to receive that training. And it takes a long time. And also it's discoordinated, right? The UK is training a handful, the Americans, the French, all these different countries, the trainers probably speak different languages, have different ad sense, different ways of describing different things. I'm, I'm sure this has been an absolutely logistical nightmare for the Ukrainians uh, to try to deal with and to try to coordinate their forces and things like that and so i'm sure it would be helpful to have french and lithuanian trainers inside of ukraine but connor it seems to me that they would just be massive targets for the russians and that would be uh just a, a real concern to me um Next up here, France rejects U.S. call to give Russian central bank funds to Ukraine. And so, you know, kind of interesting, Connor, kind of, that you have these remarks almost offset from each other, where France seems to be the most willing, uh, at least publicly, uh, NATO member state to really push for sending troops into Ukraine. But then you have the French uh, central bank saying no to Janet Yellen's plan to give the $300 billion in frozen Russian central bank funds to Ukraine. Uh, the, I think, yeah, the uh, head of the French, oh, the French finance ministry, not the head of the French central bank said, we don't think this is a uh, legal basis is sufficient. This legal basis must be accepted, not only in the European countries, not only in the G7 countries, but also all the member states of the world community. And I mean, by all member states of the G20, we should not add any kind of diversion among the G20 countries. And my guess here is they're concerned about Asian markets, particularly China and maybe India, uh, could be Brazil, uh, some of these South Americans, uh, uh, 
South Africa, stuff like that, these countries as well, who may say, well, you know, if you're going to steal the Russian money when they leave it in your markets, if you decide that you no longer like Russia, what happens when you no longer like China or Brazil or one of these other countries? And so this is going to accelerate de-dollarization. There's a good chance that this is actually going to be uh, a, just another massive own goal on on behalf of, uh, you know, what the Americans have tried to do in their economic war against Russia and just how it has failed time and time again. Next up here, I, I thought this was interesting. So Senator claims American parts found in Russian rep weapons. Senator Richard Blumenthal, he's a Democrat from Connecticut and the per, uh, the head of the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations. And he organized a hearing to present evidence about American components manufactured in the past two years being found in Russian weapons. He said this folder that he handed me was a powerful indictment of our export control system. I am appalled that American technology breakthroughs are sustaining Russian belligerence. And so I want to make two points here, Connor. One, I don't want to endorse what Senator Blumenthal is saying or in whatever his source are saying. I have no way to confirm that uh, this is actually going on. Um, the the reasons I want to mention are one I I'm not sure what kind of like propaganda they're going to work about about this but Blumenthal is a, a pretty prominent anti-Russian uh, you know American so I imagine he has something plotted here but also so often we hear oh Iranian components were found in weapons and all these other countries components were found in weapons and you know it's really important to notice that. When it's an American component that's found in another country's weapon, that's not a sign of something nefarious. That's just, you, you know, something that happens. They're not going to take action or sanction American companies. Uh, I really doubt it. So next up here, Russia claims first Abrams tank kill in Ukraine. Russia's military has, oh, this is from Will Porter at the Libertarian Institute. Russia's military has claimed to have destroyed a U.S. supplied M1 Abrams main battle tank in Ukraine for the first time, with reports stating the multi-million dollar weapon system was knocked out by a cheaply made suicide drone. The Defense Ministry announced the claims on Tuesday, following a flurry of operations around the city of Advika, which fell to Russian forces earlier this month, following a major Ukrainian pullback. And Connor, my understanding, and I've looked at some battle maps recently, it seems that uh, kind of as predicted, the Ukrainians are in some trouble and are not just, you know, maybe losing territory right um you know, right around Avika, but in other places as well, you know, that this city was actually uh, fairly important to the front. I know that the mainstream media really attempted to play this down once Russia took the city. Oh, this is a symbolic victory for the Russians. Look how much Putin invested in this and everything. Well, it's turning out not to be uh, just a symbolic victory, but also at least a, a minor strategic victory as well. All right, next up here, this article I wrote for the Libertarian Institute, mainstream British journalists demand access to Gaza. So over 50 UK-based journalists who report for mainstream outlets released a letter demanding that Israel allow more reporters into Gaza. Israel has killed over 120 Palestinian journalists and caused a communications blackout on the Strip that has stifled reporting on the scale of destruction in Gaza. Tel Aviv has allowed select members of the corporate press to take guided tours in Gaza. The letter was signed by reporters from Sky News, the BBC, ITV, Channel 4, CNN, ABC, NBC, and CBS. And this was the uh, and this was first reported in UK media. The letter states almost five months into the war in Ukraine, foreign reporters are still being denied access to the territory outside of the rare escorted trips with the Israeli military. We urge the government of Israel and Egypt to allow free and unfettered access to all Gaza for foreign media. Some of the few guided trips into Gaza have resulted in embarrassment for Israel. After taking journalists to Al-Shifa Hospital and a cemetery in Gaza, mainstream outlets reported that the Israeli curated evidence did not match the claims put forward by Israeli officials. Um, so the letter adds, there is intense global interest in the events in Gaza. And for now, the only reporting has come from journalists who are already based there. It is vile that local journalist safety is respected and their efforts are bolstered by the journalism of members of the international media. 
Overall, the Israeli forces have killed over 120 journalists. Sharif Mansour, the Committee to Protect Journalists, CPJ's Middle East and North Africa program coordinator, said the Israeli Gaza war is the most dangerous situation for journalists we have ever seen. And these figures show them clearly. The Israeli army has killed more journalists in 10 weeks than any other army or entity has in a single year. CPJ found that Israel was responsible for nearly 75% of all journalists' deaths worldwide in 2023. More than three-quarters of the 99 journalists and media workers killed worldwide in 2023 died in the Israel-Gaza war, the majority of them Palestinians killed in Israeli attacks on Gaza. The CPJ report concluded... The conflict claimed the lives of more journalists in three months than has ever been killed in a single country over an entire year. The letter adds, uh, not this isn't from CPJ, this is the the British journalist, the need for comprehensive on-the-ground reporting of the conflict is imperative. In under five months, the Israeli military operations have decimated the Strip over now the the official death toll from the Palestinian Health Ministry is 30,000. Connor will have a little bit more of a significant update on that uh, later in the show, um, including now the number is over 12,500 12, children. Thousands of others are missing. Many are assumed to be dead and buried under the rubble. Additionally, the widespread destruction in Gaza combined with the restriction on aid has caused the human- caused a humanitarian crisis. Several infants are reported to have starved to death over the past week. And Connor, while this letter is nice, it is clearly just too little too late. Um, you know, for a, a lot of purposes, you know, the, the strip has been destroyed. It's not like if Israel just ended the um, military campaign today and went back to the pre-war policy of allowing 500 aid trucks into Gaza. That isn't a sustainable situation. That isn't a situation that is going to prevent the genocide of the Palestinians. It will be a far slower death for the Palestinians that way than the, the current policy, but Uh, That is the policy. So next up here is one of the more horrific things that has uh, happened in the Israeli war on Gaza. Over 100 dead after Israeli military opens fire on Palestinian crowds surrounding aid convoy. And Connor, this is almost unbelievable. Um, Well, first of all, you know, I, I initially saw the reports and I thought to myself, you know, before I go run on ads and I post how awful the IDF is and everything, let me make sure, like, I nail it down. And when I went and looked, the Israeli military was already saying that, yes, they did open fire on a crowd of Palestinians that were surrounding an aid convoy because the soldiers felt endangered. So here's what we know the narrative so far and connor it seems to me that there's a lot of video out there of this and so i'm guessing over the coming probably week to two to three weeks we're going to get a very good and detailed timeline of what happened here uh so i just want to kind of go over it more generally here because i do think this is an extremely significant event i think this is the kind of thing uh like the bombing of the al ali hospital early in the conflict that really took a drew a lot of people's attention in and if i don't think the i don't think if the Israeli government was not able to convince people that not only was the U S media culpable in the, you know, genocide against the Israeli people by, you know, reporting that I believe correctly by saying it was an Israeli strike on the hospital, but just the way that the, you know, uh, that they were kind of bullied and, you know, everybody then believed it was a Hamas misfired rocket that killed all those people really toned down the temperature of, you know, people saying that, that we need to do something about what Israeli Israel is doing in Gaza. And I think that this might have a similar effect. Uh, so the way the BBC reports it is more than 100 Palestinians are reported to have been killed while waiting for aid to be delivered in northern Gaza. I don't know if we're ever really going to know the true number of dead here, Connor. I saw several reports and videos of I mean, the the scene is almost undescribable in the world today. It's a completely bombed out city with, you know, three or four dead people piled onto the back of a cart pulled by a donkey. And 
you, you know, I think they're trying to bring those bodies somewhere, probably to a morgue, uh, uh, unofficial hospital, some kind of UN facility, uh, somewhere where the Gaza House Health Ministry is operating. So, you know, those deaths get counted and added to the death toll. And, and so, again, it's probably going to be hard to transport all those bodies and for everybody to be sure of who got killed where. The, the over 100 number seems pretty widely reported and pretty widely accepted. The only source that seemed to have any dispute for that whatsoever was Atsios, who felt the need to describe it as dozens of Palestinians killed. So from my understanding and from the position of the IDF, they say that there was a mob around this aid convoy, which it, it does seem to be the case. This is the first aid convoy to reach the northern half of the Gaza Strip in, I think, nearly a month at this point. People are starving to death, and so people started jumping on the aid convoy for whatever reason, uh, you know. It may be that soldiers felt endangered. It may be that the soldiers just want to carry out the genocide. I don't know. The soldiers certainly opened fire. The IDF admits the soldiers opened fire and killed at least 10 of the Palestinians with gunshot wounds. They also say they shot people intentionally in the legs. And I saw videos of quite a few people uh, with, with gunshot wounds to the legs here. So uh, the hundreds of wounded made sense. Now, the IDF wants to portray this as 10 people were killed by the IDF, but hundreds were killed by essentially the mob and the Palestinian criminals that caused the trampling event. This is completely absurd and the stupidest thing I've ever heard, Connor. If there was like a, a parade or something happening in the U.S., right, and there was a shootout and, you, you know, the, the two people shooting at each other cause other people to get trampled to death, nobody would look at the police and say, ah, you should have had this under control better. They would, you know, blame the two people who had the shootout and cause, you know, the, the trampling situation to occur. And so... For the Israeli military to try to blame the Palestinians here is just sick. And the fact that they thought they could get away with it, they actually published videos of this, like drone footage of this, claiming that it showed their narrative was correct. And I think people are just going to find it completely sick and disgusting that, that the IDF did this. Uh, then there are also reports that tank shells and certainly... If you look at the damage done around, it, it does it looks more significant than gunfire. Now, the only reason I can't I don't feel comfortable saying that um you you know that this seems to be that the taint shells really did hit it. It's just there's so much extensive damage done to the Gaza Strip. It, it it's hard, you know, for a complete outsider to determine if this was done you know, this last night or two weeks ago or two months ago, because Israel has just been decimating uh, the Gaza Strip for, for such a long time. So uh, this is really, really awful things happening here, Connor, in Gaza. Uh, speaking of aid deliveries, the cradle reports that the number of aid trucks getting into Gaza has plummeted. I recently wrote an article where Samantha Power, the head of USAID, said that number was 85 trucks a day, which was about half to third of what it was a couple weeks ago so that seemed to be a real admission to me uh but the way that this is being presented by the the cradle and uh some of the uh palestinian press and some of the you know international air press in the region that this is actually a way overstatement they say uh on february 21st only 13 trucks entered through one crossing and four entered through another so that would only be a total of 14 um, and then they noted that on some days, only four trucks were entering the besieged enclave in total. Um, I, I don't know why these numbers seem so off from what Samantha Power put out. Maybe they count the airdrops from the Jordanians as a certain amount of aid trucks getting into the country. Uh, it's a little unclear, but either way, you know, anything under 500 is, is an absolute travesty. Uh, but, you know, anything under 100, and if it's down to 13 or, you know, 17 or 4, I mean, that it's just it's stoking the fires of the famine. As we have the Gaza Health Ministry reporting that six children have died from dehydration and malnutrition at hospitals in Gaza. So, um, it, it's just, it's, it's horrific. Uh, and then the last thing I have here before I hand it over to Connor is this other article I wrote for the Institute top European union official says Israel created Hamas to divide Palestinians and Connor, 
Everybody knows this. I don't have to really go through all this on the show because you wrote such a good article with Scott Horton on this that everybody should go read. However, when Joseph Burrell says this, it makes it harder to just declare that you're an anti-Semite, right? This is the high representative of the European Union of Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, Joseph Burrell. Uh, you know, he's somebody who led the negotiations between the European Union and Iran trying to restore the, the nuclear deal. I'm not saying that he's like a good man or, or anything by those means, but he's an establishment man. You know, he represents the establishment European foreign policy. And he is saying right here that, you know, it is unquestionable reality that Israel has bet on dividing the Palestinians, creating a force to oppose Fatah. Uh, and this is a set. And he actually said something similar last month. I think I might have covered it on the show. Then he said, we believe that a two state solution must be imposed from the outside to bring peace. Although I insist Israel is reaffirming its refusal of this solution and to prevent they have gone as far as to create Hamas themselves. Hamas has been financed by the Israeli government to weaken the Palestinian authority of Fatah. He clarified his position during the forum on Monday. He said, I didn't say that Israel financed it by sending a check, but it has enabled the development of Hamas as a rival to the Palestinian authority. And Connor, this isn't something that's unknown. This is something that's openly bragged about in Tel Aviv. And even recently, uh, Netanyahu boasted that everyone knows I'm the one for decades who blocked the establishment of a Palestinian state that would endanger our existence. So, uh, you know, the, the Israelis just are so open about it. All right, Connor, I'm going to hand it over to you. I you know you got a couple articles here, including this great one that you wrote for antiwar.com uh, last at the end of last week. Yes, absolutely. Uh, as the genocide gets worse and worse in Gaza, the Israelis are uh, taking the opportunity to drastically ramp up home demolitions in East Jerusalem, which would uh, be, of course, uh, in a two-state solution. East Jerusalem would be the capital of a Palestinian, an independent Palestinian state. Uh, but if, And since the Trump administration and the U.S. moving its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, it, it signifies that the U.S. is uh, absolutely against the Palestinians ever having uh, that, you know, ever, first of all, ever ending the occupation in any meaningful sense, uh, let alone the Palestinians uh, having East Jerusalem as their capital for their state. And uh, they're destroying the, the, you know, dozens and dozens of Palestinians' homes. Uh, at this rate, it's going to get a lot worse. So we'll go through the math and see how much worse it's been uh, just compared with the first nine months of last year. But before I get there, I just want to update everybody. As you mentioned earlier, the current, uh, the latest death toll numbers, and I recommend there's a great live tracker from Al Jazeera. Uh, that um, people can use. Uh, and the latest is 30,035 uh, Palestinians have been killed in Gaza. And the breakdown of that is 12,300 children, 8,400 women. Uh, and then you have over 70,000 injured. And then in the West Bank, as we're going to get to, but my numbers in this article will be out of date, are we have 414 people killed, including 108 children, and about 4,600 uh, injured. OK, so um, to get to this story, under the cover of the Israeli genocide and ethnic cleansing campaign against the Gaza Strip, which has killed, as I say now, 30,000 civilians, Tel Aviv is ramping up these home demolitions in occupied East Jerusalem. So this is uh, based on a report uh, I found and we got in Al Jazeera uh, where they're discussing how in the eastern side of the city, the Jerusalem municipality has been escalating home demolitions, uh, really taking advantage of. Uh, the war on Gaza, uh, you know, so being able to do this under the radar, uh, at least as far as uh, international media is uh, concerned. And so East Jerusalem, where 362,000 Palestinians live, uh, has been illegally occupied, uh, as with the rest of the West Bank and Gaza, uh, for almost 60 years. So the pseudo justification that the government in Tel Aviv uses to justify this institutionalized destruction of Palestinian homes is the claim that these residences are being built without permits. And the reason for that is the municipality only issues uh, to exclusively Jewish, these permits, um, they usually only issue them to exclusively Jewish neighborhoods. And therefore, Palestinians are left without options and have to build their homes in the absence of these permits. So 
about 28 percent of their East Jerusalem homes have been deemed illegal. Uh, municipal elections are also going to be held at the end of the month. And so in a bid to appeal to these Jewish constituencies, activists, uh, fear candidates are demanding more Palestinian homes be bulldozed. So the far right deputy mayor of Jerusalem, for instance, his name is Arya King. He's running for mayor and he's calling to prevent Palestinians from building homes in order to maintain Jewish demographic dominance over the indigenous population, the Palestinian, uh, Muslims and Christians. So King has previously referred to Palestinians as subhuman. Um, and so he said, uh, this is uh, f- a quote from Fakiri Abu Dayab, who we're going to get to in a moment. He's a prominent uh, human rights activist, Palestinian, and the elected spokesperson of the Silwan district in East Jerusalem. Uh, and his home was recently bulldozed, and now his kids and his grandkids are homeless. But uh, his quote in reference to this uh, current deputy mayor is that if King does become the next mayor in the coming elections, the situation will become quite difficult. He's openly threatened to demolish Palestinian homes and kill uh, Palestinians. So um, Abu Dayab's home uh, was bulldozed after 20 or 30 officers stormed his house. Uh, as I say, he's left homeless with his children, and his grandchildren uh, in order to find places to sleep. They're having to move from home to home, relying on friends and relatives. Um, moreover, Abu Dayab might not be able to afford the cost of his own home being destroyed by the Israeli authorities because in the apartheid state of Israel, which we're told, you know, of course, we have so much in common with in these Western values and, and the democracy and what a secular, you know, what a progressive society they are. I mean, look at the size of their gay pride parades. When they uh, demolish Palestinians' homes like this, they charge the Palestinians tens of thousands of dollars to pay, not just for the demolition itself and the price of the bulldozing and and this complete abomination itself, but also the, 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 the salaries of the officers who were taking part in the destruction and the evictions. So you know, he expects his bill to be about twenty thousand or thirty thousand dollars. And already most of the Palestinian uh, homes in the area have been ordered to be destroyed. So uh, they quote in the Al Jazeera piece, Daniel Seidemann, an Israeli lawyer uh, who's specializing in these uh, issues. He told Al Jazeera that before the war, there were roughly 20,000 outstanding demolition orders and those orders never expire. So Uh, Home demolitions are, of course, legal under international law uh, unless they're deemed necessary for military operations. And and under international law, Israel's occupation of the West Bank, East Jerusalem and Gaza is illegal uh, and in in violation of the Fort Geneva Convention. And the settlements are completely um, in violation of the Fort Geneva Convention and several U.N. resolutions. Uh, Will Porter just wrote a great piece about that for us for the Institute and home and how the U.S. is walked back the Trump policy of denying that, but with really no uh, um, substantive effect. I mean, it's not as if we're going to condition aid. (laughs) We're not conditioning aid over a live stream genocide. So there's not much hope that it's anything is going to change over this, unfortunately, with the current uh, government in power. And I mean here, too, obviously. But um, so uh, home demolitions are legal under international law, but Israel has imposed an illegal structure which allows systemic abuse to be carried out against the occupied Palestinians. So the way it's explained by Omar Shakir, the Israeli-Palestine director of Human Rights Watch, he tells Al Jazeera, there are different mechanisms to enforce demolitions, each of which ultimately furthers the same objective of forcing Palestinians off their land and maximizing land for the Jewish Israelis. And he li- highlights the increasing paranoia that Palestinians are suffering as the dem- demolition Demolitions pile up. He says the tense atmosphere at the moment is causing Palestinians to think that they have a demolition order. And again, 20,000 homes have these. uh, Then their home could be destroyed next. So uh, they cite Ir Amim, which is a local nonprofit that focuses on uh, home demolitions. And apparently, by their numbers, East Jerusalem has seen 87 Palestinian residences destroyed by the Israeli authorities since the October 7th Hamas attack and the ensuing uh, genocidal ethnic cleansing in Gaza uh, carried out by the Israeli forces, uh, compare with 97 home demolitions during the first nine months of 2023. So in just, you know, under five months, we've seen almost as many home demolitions as in the first nine months of 2023. 
Um, now, as Amy Cohen, the director of the international relations and advocacy for this group, Ira Meme, she explains these demolitions are done under the guise of law enforcement as if a bureaucratic measure, but it's actually a form of state violence and it serves as a mechanism for Pal- of Palestinian displacement to drive them from the city designedly to make it eventually completely Jewish. Uh, and the White House recently reversed course on Israel's Jewish only colonies in the West Bank. Uh, uh, and I cite Will's article here, in the, which, uh, as I say, is in violation of a whole long line of UN Security Council re- resolutions and the Fort Geneva Convention. And so Antony Blinken came out and described the exclusivist Jewish only colonies as inconsistent with international law, as Israeli authorities are reportedly planning vast settlement expansions, um, uh, as announced recently uh, by. Um, Bezalel Smotrich, the finance minister who also holds this position in the defense ministry, which makes him effectively the governor of the West Bank, and he's in charge of settlement expansion and settlement construction. And so, uh, of course, Mike Pompeo, the ardent, I mean, he and Blinken are both ardent Zionists. They just come at it from different perspectives, really. Uh, But um, Pompeo had proclaimed that the settlements are not in violation of international law, which everybody knew was a complete farce. But that's how far to the that's how radically Zionist the Trump administration was. But virtually all those policies, except this one uh, that Trump uh, rolled out, including moving the embassy, recognizing Israel's uh, annexation of the Golan Heights, um, you know, of course, maintaining the permanent occupation in Syria when as as, as on, you know, on behalf of Israel, um, these policies have all been carried have been carried over by the Joe Biden administration. Uh, the the maximum pressure campaign against Iran, a refusal to return to the JCPOA, uh, et cetera. So again, in the West Bank, we have roughly uh, seven hundred thousand illegal settlers residing there. Uh, local media suggests that about three thousand new homes are going to be built in the occupied territories. Last year, uh, the Israeli government, led by Netanyahu, was already setting records. Uh, for settlement expansion. They came to power in December of 2022. And so concurrently, violence is surging in the West Bank as Israel systematically annihilates the Gaza Strip. We have all, we, as I said earlier, about 414 Palestinians have been killed, including over 100 children. UNICEF has already said that, uh, you know, in addition to these home demolitions getting out of control, there was that report from UNICEF describing last year as the deadliest year for Palestinian children in the West Bank on record. All signs are pointing that the ruthless Israeli military raids and settler led pogroms are going to persist. So it could, it's very likely going to be much worse this year. Um, and with, there's no end to the war in sight. And last week in the Occupy West Bank village of Burqa, settlers attacked Palestinian homes with Molotov cocktails and destroyed vehicles, uh, while enjoying, uh, full protection provided by the Israeli occupation forces. And we covered that story on, uh, last week's show, uh, as well. Okay, so uh, moving to Syria, Uh, we have uh, Israel's bombing Syria just outside Damascus, uh, again, which could uh, always lead to a wider expansion of the war. But Israel's been bombing Syria virtually on a weekly basis uh, for years and years now, uh, ever since really the uh, the American led dirty war against Damascus was launched. Um, But it's gotten much worse since October 7th. Um, and we, and so, uh, Dave DeCamp wrote this piece up yesterday, uh, at for antiwar.com on the 28th. So Israeli airstrikes were launched against Syria on Wednesday, targeting an area outside of Damascus. And, uh, this is from Syria Sanan news agency. So their report said that the, their air defenses intercepted some of the Israeli missiles and a military source says that the strikes only caused material damage. There were no casualties reported. A correspondent for Lebanon's al Mayadeen reported that the missiles targeted the al uh, Sayeda Zinab, an area. Uh, uh, south of Damascus, but loud explosions were heard even further south. Now, Israel's bombed Syria with impunity for years, and um, uh, Dave, as he points out here, it's gotten more dangerous uh, because, um, you know, the nature of the strikes, we've seen, you know, especially after the war got started, the bombing of the civilian infrastructure was stepped up. So we saw not that they weren't bombing the uh, Aleppo International Airport and the Damasco, the Damascus International Airport on a regular basis. But. Excuse me, but. um You know, those attacks were stepped up quite significantly. And then uh, we've seen, of course, several IRGC uh, officers and members killed in these recent strikes. Uh, And over the past few months, 
Uh, that, of course, is leads to this situation where we could get into a much wider war. We've seen several assassinations in Lebanon and in Syria carried out by the Israelis, which could trigger an escalation with Iran. And, uh, you know, no doubt that would drag the United States uh, into uh, of a fight with Iran. And that could be exactly what Netanyahu is looking for. But uh, so far, it hasn't happened. The Iranians have been very restrained in their responses to American and Israeli provocations. And the last suspected Israeli airstrike in Syria hit an area near the Lebanon border over the weekend. And uh, Jason Ditz wrote an article about that covering it at antiwar.com. Um, where three Hezbollah members were killed. Before that, an Israeli airstrike hit a residential building in Damascus where at least two people uh, were killed. Now, Israeli, uh, excuse me, Israel also continues to launch attacks in Lebanon. These airstrikes as the risk of a full-blown war with Hezbollah grows. And, uh, and then we're going to get into this more in the next story. But Hezbollah has said, of course, as Kyle covered on the previous show, that they would stop firing on northern Israel if a ceasefire is reached between Hamas and the Israelis. But Israel has already said, uh, as Jason covered over the weekend, uh, Yoav Gallant, the defense minister, is is basically uh, – you know, declaring that if there is a ceasefire with Hamas, we're just going to step up the war with Hezbollah independently. Uh, so and again, the American Congress and the executive branch are specifically spending 14 additional billion dollars beyond the normal $3.8 billion American taxpayers are forced to fork over to this apartheid state every year because they need to be prepared for a multi-front war. And that could mean you know, Hezbollah, uh, the, whether there's going to be some kind of a further conflict with the Syrian Arab army or the other, uh, you know, the Iranian and Hezbollah uh, forces in Syria, uh, certainly uh, the in, in continuing war with uh, in Gaza, uh, the assault on Rafah, which is coming, which is predict is some estimates are saying that, you know, we could see 100,000 people killed and injured as a result of that. It could be worse. I mean, uh and of course, there's going to be, you know, we've seen Israel bomb Iraq in the last uh, few years going after the Shiite militias there as well. So uh, who knows how far this war uh, is going to expand? Uh, that doesn't seem to be really the concern of Congress, just that, that they have the weapons to do it. Um, and I mean, it's just absolutely shameful. Now, this next story is really interesting. So the Houthis are saying they're going to reassess their Red Sea attacks if Israel's onslaught in Gaza uh, ends. And again, this gets to the point where the Americans and the Israelis are the ones who are insistent on continuing this war. And it's very obvious that the U.S. needs to use its leverage with Israel in order to prevent the chances of a absolutely catastrophic regional war breaking out and let alone ending this genocide or at least U.S. support for it. Um, now, so a spokesman for the Houthis, and this is again from Dave DeCamp at Antiwar.com from uh, yesterday, the 28th. Now, a spokesman for the Houthis has reaffirmed to Reuters what they've been saying this whole time, that the group's attacks on commercial shipping in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden will only be reassessed if Israel's brutal campaign in Gaza comes to an end. So uh, Mohammed Abdul Salam, uh, the, the Houthi spokesman, says, quote, there will be no halt to any operations that help the Palestinian people except when the Israeli aggression on Gaza and the siege stops. So a ceasefire in Gaza would bring regional calm, as Hezbollah has also made clear that they will stop launching rocket attacks against targets in northern Israel if Hamas and Israel agreed to a truce. However, Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant has threatened that a ceasefire in Gaza only means an escalation, an Israeli escalation against Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. So during the seven-day ceasefire in November, which facilitated the exchange of more than 100 hostages uh, and prisoners on both sides, there was a calm along the Lebanon-Israel border, and Houthi attacks on shipping largely subsided. So U.S. officials recently told CNN that they believe a new ceasefire would likely bring an end to the Houthi attacks against Israeli-linked shipping. And, uh, you know, since the Americans and the Brits started bombing uh, Yemen instead of holding Israel accountable, uh, the attacks on American and British uh, linked uh, shipping uh, as well. And so the Houthis, again, officially known as Ansar Allah, have been clear that since they started these attacks against Israeli linked shipping, the only way it was ever going to stop is if the siege was lifted, humanitarian aid was allowed to flow into the Gaza Strip unimpeded. And the bombing and the assault against Gaza uh, was ended. 
So instead of pressuring Israel to agree to a ceasefire, we have London and Washington launching a new bombing campaign against the Houthis in January, which only makes the situation worse. Predictably, the Houthis respond by targeting American and British commercial shipping, and they've successfully hit several vessels. So the U.S. and the U.K. have launched four major rounds of airstrikes, but the U.S. has been launching unilateral airstrikes on a near daily basis against Yemen, the poorest country in the Middle East. So President Biden launched the new war without authorization from Congress. Um, Senators are are grilling the Biden, uh, you know, uh, the White House officials uh, on Tuesday um, over the lack of uh, authorization. And they said the president has no authority to claim self-defense under Article two of the Constitution uh, since the campaign was launched in defense of foreign ships, not American ships. So we have even Senator Tim Kaine, the Democrat, um, you know, former running mate of Hillary Clinton. Uh, from uh, Virginia saying Article 2 self-defense means you can defend U.S. personnel, you can defend U.S. military assets, you probably can defend U.S. commercial ships, he says, but the defense of other nations, commercial ships in no way, and it's not even close, that's not self-defense, he says. Uh, So as is always important to point out, the U.S. backed a Saudi UAE, uh, excuse me, a Saudi and United Arab Emirates led coalition against the Houthis in this brutal war from 2015 to 2022, uh, which killed. <clears throat> this is a very likely uh, a low estimate, and it's years old now. But um, the U.N. estimated that by the end of 2021, 377,000 people had been killed and the vast majority of those are babies and children under five who were starved to death and killed by deprivation or disease as a result of a a full air, land and sea blockade put under Yemen, uh, imposed on Yemen, uh, supported by the U.S. uh, And uh, of course, the just leveling of all every kind of life sustaining civilian infrastructure you can think of. And so during that time, the Houthis they only became more powerful as as a formidable fighting force, and they developed missile and drone technology that gave them the ability to hit Saudi oil infrastructure and UAE oil infrastructure. So, uh, you know, and 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 because of that, they had more leverage. And there was uh, there's been a ceasefire that's held uh, relatively well since April of 2022, but. Uh, New American sanctions against the group are now blocking the the implementation of a peace deal. And that is uh, desperately needed for these poor people who have been suffering for so long. But it's very obvious that this administration and this Congress have absolutely no problem being covered in blood. So uh, this uh, next story is from the cradle. I thought this was interesting. This is about Hamas's response to Biden's sort of perceived gaffe of speaking too early about um, you know, when, uh, he expects there to be a ceasefire, a temporary ceasefire based on the Paris talks that have been ongoing. Uh, and so, you know, they're accusing him of engaging in psychological warfare. So here we have Biden eating ice cream with Seth Myers, one of the late night hacks. Um, he was also protested by some Jewish anti, uh, Zionist groups, um, and who apparently did a pretty good job of, uh, taking over a 30 Rockefeller, uh, plaza and, uh, you know, making it uncomfortable for genocide Joe. Uh, but so this, uh, so the article says Hamas official Ahmad Abdul Hadi start stated on the 27th of February that a leaked proposal for a ceasefire deal in Gaza is part of quote, psychological warfare campaign being carried out by the U S so details of the alleged proposal were leaked to Reuters on Monday, the same day that Joe Biden said he hoped a ceasefire agreement between Israel and Hamas could be reached by next Monday, the, four, the March 4th. So he says, my national security advisor tells me they're close. They're close. They're not done yet. My hope is by next Monday we'll have a ceasefire. And uh, Biden was eating ice cream while he said this, of, of course. And so he claimed uh, this during an appearance with Myers and and Abdul Hadi, the, the Hamas representative in Lebanon, stated that the resistance movement is not satisfied with the proposal and they will not compromise on any of their demands, particularly, quote, on a ceasefire and reaching an honorable, serious deal. And so, of course, this is where the problems come in, uh, because Israel is never an honest broker in 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 negotiations with Palestinians anyway, but especially something uh, like this. So Hamas is just seeking a permanent end to the war. They want to see the release of thousands of Palestinian prisoners, political prisoners, uh, locked up in Israeli jails. Um, Israel is seeking the release 
of 136 captives still held by Hamas in Gaza and a temporary ceasefire that would allow it, you know, ostensibly they're trying to get the hostages back. Uh, and they want a temporary ceasefire, which would allow them to then go back to Rafa, where we have uh, about <clears throat> 1.5 million Palestinians packed in these tents out in the rain and the mud out on the streets with no food and water or medicine. They still want to go in there and genocide those people uh, and just, you know, kill them by the by the, thou the thousands and tens of thousands. They're just saying they would, you know, the idea, I guess the administration and, and, and the Israelis potentially may be willing to wait a few weeks before they do that. Um, so what they what the Hamas spokesman is saying, we are open to any ideas posed by mediators, but uh, we're also keen on preserving our key demands. So he told uh, al Mayadeen, he says that Israel is, quote, seeking to hold Hamas accountable for any later failures in the talks. So they're planning to use this as an excuse to pave the way for the invasion of Rafah. And he says the leaks were not part of the Paris negotiations, but a U.S. and Israeli attempt to give the public an illusion that Hamas had approved of them. And he reiter reiterated that, quote, everything being shared is not serious. This is a ploy to maneuver and press on the resistance. So the proposal leaked to Reuters outlines plans for a 40 day truce during which Hamas would free around 40 hostages, including female soldiers, uh, those under 19 or over 50 years old and the sick, in return for about uh, 400 Palestinians held captive in Israel, <clears throat> leaving thousands behind Israeli bars, uh, of course. And so Israel would withdraw their troops from the populated areas of Gaza, supposedly, and displace Gaza residents, excluding men of fighting age, would be permitted to return to their homes. Israel would be required to allow additional humanitarian aid to enter Gaza as hundreds of thousands of Palestinians uh, in the Strip are um, starving to death or on the verge of starvation. So Palestinian Islamic Jihad also responded to the leaked Paris proposal. They said the leaks are an attempt to pressure the Palestinians and incite them against the resistance. They are pushing for a ceasefire before Ramadan in anticipation of what might happen in Al-Quds. The Israelis are always uh, going, as we've covered before and around this time of year, every, every year, uh, the Israelis go to the Al-Aqsa Mosque uh, and absolutely the third holiest site in all of Islam during Ramadan and just compl on camera every year, absolutely just brutalize men, women, children, the elderly, beat the hell out of them. Uh, they go in and they desecrate all the holy sites. They attack them with sound bombs and flashbangs and, uh, you know, rubber coated bullets, uh, shooting people in the eyes and all kinds of horrible things. Um, and, uh, and when this happens over the last few years, it always stokes, um, tensions with the uh, militant groups, the resistance factions in Gaza. Uh, but the Palestinians are more united than ever. And, and it's been going that the trend was going that way anyway, especially since um, Operation Guardian of the Walls, which was provoked by these sort of attacks on, Al on the Al-Aqsa Mosque and uh, pogroms in uh, East Jerusalem uh, and evictions and, and ethnic cleansing that was ongoing. Uh, but you know, it, it, I'm, I predict that things are only going to get worse. And there were, there was a, Israel had a launched a bombing campaign against Gaza this past May, in May of 2023, uh, over just this sort of, um, these, just these sort of attacks and abuses of the Palestinians at during Ramadan. And, uh, it got so bad. They were even, um, uh, bombing Lebanon, uh, in response, uh, to, uh, you know, they, they, to rocket fire that was coming from Lebanon. Not from Hezbollah, but uh, it just to show, just to, it goes to show how all of this can escalate very easily, and so uh, so the quote is that they're um, they're uh, they, they're uh, before Ramadan, so they are pushing for a ceasefire before Ramadan in anticipation of what might happen in Al Quds. The enemy believes that it can deceive the resistance with different methods in order to achieve a victory. It is if it has failed to achieve on the ground. Um, and this is the uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad Politico Bureau member uh, uh, named Ishan Ataya. He's speaking to Al Maidin. Those are those quotes. So in Gaza, residents speaking to Reuters expressed mixed feelings about the possible outcomes. Can't even imagine being. Um, in these people's shoes, but we have a uh, father of five from Gaza City, uh, Musafa Basal, who's a, now uh, displaced to Rafa, says, quote, we don't want a pause. We want a permanent ceasefire. We want an end to the killing. And then um, 
he says, unfortunately, people's conditions are so grim that some may accept a pause even just during Ramadan. They want a permanent end to the war, but the dire conditions make them want to pause even for a month or 40 days in the hope that it becomes uh, permanent. And of course, has excuse me, Hamas's proposal for a 135 day ceasefire leading ultimately to a release of thousands of prisoners, uh, you know, an end to the fight, a real ceasefire, the release of all the Israeli hostages um, and uh, leading to a permanent settlement. That is actually what everybody should be pushing for right now. Uh, sorry if the idea is coming from Hamas, but that that is what is necessary. There needs to be an independent Palestinian state or there just has to be an end to this apartheid regime. And that may all sound pie in the sky, but what the U.S. can do is at least cut all aid to Israel and demand a ceasefire um, and or just use its leverage to impose that reality um, or it, in, it do its absolute best to. Um, because in the meantime, we're complicit in this genocide, um, as far as the rest of the world is concerned. And so, uh, it, it's just, just absolutely disgraceful. But, uh, so this next story, and again, this is, I'm not sure if Lloyd Austin is miss, is it, I mean, I don't know where he got this number. If he's just thinking of the overall death toll in Gaza or what's been recorded so far, of people, you know, winding up dead in the morgues that have been able to, uh, be, uh, cataloged by the uh, the Gaza Health Ministry, or if he believe, has intel, a reason to believe, and, and it, it, it actually, this number does sound much more plausible. Maybe he's, you know, ta- thinking of the uh, thousands of people who are trapped and buried under rubble and presumed dead. But our, Ra- our Raytheon um, board member slash, uh, you know, defense secretary, Lloyd Austin says, <clears throat> excuse me, Israel has killed over 25,000 women and children in Gaza. And this is a a write-up from today by Dave DeCamp at Antiwar.com. So Pentagon Chief Lloyd Austin said today, well, this is Thursday, that Israel has killed over 25,000 Palestinian women and children in Gaza since October 7th. And he said this to members of Congress. It is really bizarre. I mean, we've been through a lot of wars in our lifetime, just uh, Kyle's in my lifetime. And uh, I got to say, Um, I do think it was a watershed moment when John Kirby came out and said uh, to, you know, a few weeks into the war, maybe four or five weeks after they were playing these games of accusing the numbers of being fudged and, oh, it's the Hamas run health ministry and all this. And then he just came out and said that, you know, thousands of innocent people are going to die. And, uh, you know, that's not how any of these wars at least were sold to you know, to the American people, you know, these American, which did kill, according to the cost of war project, over four and a half million people. You know, that's a conservative estimate. Um, but to, to just come out and say that is, is shocking, especially when there's not any discussion of conditioning this unconditional support for the slaughter. So, <clears throat> excuse me, Austin is asked how many women and children have been killed. And this is during a house armed services committee hearing. And he replies, it's over 25,000. The number is higher than the estimate that's been put out by Gaza's health ministry. You know, they said on Thursday that over 30,000 have been killed so far overall. And this consistently said about 70 percent of the casualties are women and children. Uh, Other estimates put it close to about 66 percent. And and so that would put the child, the women and child death toll around 21,000. And Gaza's health ministry does not account for the thousands of civilians who are missing and presumed to be dead under the rubble or for Palestinians who may have been buried inside instead of being sent to a hospital or a morgue. The breakdown of communications in Gaza has also impeded the health ministry's ability to keep account. So in, in October, Biden accused the Palestinians of lying about the death toll which that'll, of course, be looked at the same way as like uh, Holocaust denial uh, years from now. But uh, the accused them of lying about the death toll. And was, when he was confronted about civilian casualties, uh, he said, quote, I have no notion that the Palestinians are telling the truth about how many people are killed, Biden said. Now, but a few weeks later, we have Barbara Leaf, the assistant secretary of state for Near Eastern Affairs, who acknowledged that the Gaza's health ministry numbers have always been reliable. And she said that the true death toll is likely higher than what they're reporting, uh, which is obvious to anybody. But Israeli me- is important that she said that. So Israeli media reports have also said uh, that Israeli military officials believe the health ministry's numbers are close to accurate as well. So Austin um, 
as I said earlier, uh, the former Raytheon board member, he also said the U.S. has provided Israel with 21,000 munitions since October 7 to support the massacre, which does not include the American-provided bombs that Israel was already armed with as they receive nearly $4 billion in military aid from the U.S. each year. And, um, you know, the Wall Street Journal had previously reported that we had already sent them 15,000 bombs and tens of thousands of artillery shells. Um, so, you know, I'm curious exactly what his, the breakdown on those numbers is, but I believe it was 50,000 artillery shells and this was months ago and fit and out of those 15,000 bombs, 5,000 of them were 2000 pound bombs, which were being routinely dropped in areas, uh, deemed to be the safe zones, uh, by the Israeli, uh, authorities. Uh, and so, you know, despite the massive civilian casualty rate and the International Court of Justice ruling that it's plausible Israel is committing genocide in Gaza, the U.S. continues to provide this unconditional military support and political cover. And uh, this is genocide Joe's policy. And Lloyd Austin, uh, uh, you know, I mean, it's unbelievable that he's saying this. Uh, and I, I'd like to go and watch the actual clips and see what the reactions were from members of Congress. Um, but as we've seen already, and we've covered a few times now, there are members of Congress who are just as sadistic as a lot of these Israeli officials that we see, um, inciting genocide, you know, the same kinds of quotes we saw in the South African, uh, you know, uh, case uh, made against Israel at the international court of justice. Um, you know, Netanyahu d citing the old Testament and saying, kill Alamek, you know, their women, their children, their livestock, their men, kill them all. Um, and, uh, you know, Yoav Gallant saying on, Oct I believe it was on October 9th or 10th, it was, I believe on the 9th, uh, saying that we're putting, you know, the entire strip under siege, <coughs> cutting these people off from food, water, fuel, and medicine. And we're there, we're fighting human animals. We're going to treat them accordingly. And at this point, it does look like still t at least tens of thousands of more people are going to die and they're going to push through with this ethnic cleansing campaign and get as many people as they can into uh, Egypt and in the meantime make uh, Gaza completely uninhabitable. I mean, Rafa is really the last city that hasn't been destroyed and annihilated. And uh, the plan is already they're running this major um, uh I rode uh, through the central Gaza, cutting off the two, the south from the north so that the people – no, I mean there's no – essentially there's no point in trying to return to the north now. But of course that, that all that land belongs to the Palestinians. And so even under what has been understood to be a potential two-state solution for decades. So they're stealing that. They're not going to – they're going to prevent people from – uh, returning to the north to ever try and rebuild. And um, they're just going to make everything uninhabitable, kill as many as they want until they can get rid of the Palestinians. And people are already celebrating how they're going to take that land back and whatever, put amusement parks there and uh, just resettle it uh, with these uh, radical, um, again, illegal colonists uh, that we were discussing earlier. Uh, but yeah, just more clarification as if we needed any that Israel is a completely sick society and uh, and we should have no part in any of this. But we're tied at the hip. Biden is Israel's man in Washington, has been for decades, but now he's better known as Genocide Joe. All right, Connor, thank you for that wrap up. And we will be back with um, more news soon uh sometime next week i'll have a show no it'll, it'll be the regular schedule next week uh monday wednesday friday i'll be out with shows uh thanks everyone thanks everyone thanks Kyle.